Okay. Great. Hi, Anna. How are you? Hi. Great to see you and so happy that you could make it. And uh, thank you for Google. Um, so you on their behalf. So we are very happy that you could be with us yes, and talk to startups. Thank you for the invitation. Really good to be here. <laughs> thank you. Um, I would say let's start with some uh, personal background, like in terms of uh, tell us about yourself, your background, career, any passion. So, so let's start there and then we kind of build on the discussion. Yeah, sure. Well, my background is, um, uh, well, on a personal side, I am a mother of two, two boys, six and nine. So there is never a dull or quiet moment in my life. Uh, they're very active. It's a lot of fun. Uh, my background professionally is um, I started out by uh, going to uh, the university in, in the U.S., in California, close to L.A., where I uh, have my degree in marketing communications. And after, after graduation, I, I stayed there for a few years and worked within sales and marketing. And I think that for me, that was... Uh, such such an Im important phase because um, I really learned a lot around sales and I really learned a lot uh, around you know believing in myself and and being quite good at like promoting myself uh, or in, in a good way because that's that's what you do there and I I was fortunate to have like really good professors that that believed in me and then also like my first employer so so I learned a lot there. Uh, and then I moved uh, back to Sweden in uh, 2006 and um, got introduced to two entrepreneurs who had just started a company called Keybroker. So Keybroker is uh, a digital uh, digital advertising agency now. When, when they started, uh, the idea was primarily to, to be both an, an agency but also a tech company to, to service Google ads. And at that uh, time, Google had just started in Sweden. I had worked a bit with it in the US, but it was new here. And I was offered the role as the uh, sales director to come in and build up the sales. So I was employee number four, I think. So really part of the startup team. Uh, and it was uh, terrifying and a lot of fun at the same time. I remember actually walking like i don't know how many hours i walked during that first fall with like my best friend and just trying to figure out how the heck i was going to do stuff because i had not worked in sales like that before and all of this was new uh, but luckily my dad has always been in sales and marketing and google was as new to marketing directors in Sweden as it was to anyone. So the pitches that, that I wanted to, to do to get customers in, I tried on him first. If he wouldn't understand it, no one else would understand it. So it was actually really good. And then we had some great investors early on that helped me come up with like a really good selling pricing model to, to, uh, to go out with. So, uh, and we had ambitious very, very early on to really go after the big advertisers in Sweden right away, which was also like really good because that put you in that in a mind that, you know, let's do this, like let's carve up the sleeves and, and really go after the, the big fish right away. And we succeeded quite fast and started to get one after another of like really good brands that of course then helped us in like getting even more brands on board. So it was a really, really fun time. And we got um, investor growth capital investors like VC arm that is no longer existing, but used to be existing as uh, our main owner in, in, I think it was after two years or so. And we opened up offices in other uh, countries and cities that I was responsible for. So it was a really, really fun time. Super, super hectic. And I remember when we when we reached break even, it was such such a great moment. And and uh, we then and and also another great moment was the the first year where we were profitable the full year. Um, super fun as well. So so that I did, and then I went on my first parental leave. And when I came back, I became the CEO instead. And I did that for about a year, 
and all along we worked really closely both with uh, Google and with with Facebook um, eventually and then I got the question from Google uh, if I wanted to uh, uh, become um, uh, the industry leader for retail and tech which means being responsible for the ads revenues uh, for those verticals uh, and and that was a, a good timing for me because I felt that I wanted to do something different so I, I moved over to the Google side in 2014 uh, and uh, I had that role for about a year and a half. And then I went on my second parental leave. And while out, that's when I was offered to become the country director here. So when I came back from my second maternity leave, uh, I started in this role. So it's moved, moved by quickly because it's five and a half years now. And I'm still just really enjoying it. Uh, uh, so, so I do that, and we will probably come in a bit more to that. But I do that in combination with sitting on on one board and two other advisory boards. Um, so that's a little bit about me. That's really interesting. So it started with UCLA marketing, uh, communication, and sales, and then you talked about key broker digital advertising. I can relate to some of it. My first job out of business school was a strategy director for an ad agency. Okay, and I can relate okay. to that uh, that momentum of pitching for and it was a fast growing ag agency we got a very early offer from publicis group to mm -hmm. buy out and we didn't we were young and we said no we'll do it ourselves <laughs> yeah. so, uh, so i can relate to those uh, times and really interesting to see how you describe uh, the the experience with sales but let's go a little bit there how, how do you see sales like it, Usually, uh, the first picture that comes into sales, it's, it's like a kind of a push kind of a thing, and it's mm -hmm. a lot of pressure. Is it so? No, that was actually, you know, my own thought of it as well, you know, that it okay. was almost a bad word a little bit. But, but that's where mm -hmm. I also am very thankful for my years in the US, because in the US, sales is something like very, very good. Uh, mm -hmm. It has a totally different like sound and value to it. And to me very early on you know i realized that i love sales i think it's so fun because it's so much about relationships it's so much about meeting customers mm. listening to their needs and then finding ways to you know pre present a solution based on what we can offer that will satisfy and help them reach you know their their goals and and their needs so so it's nothing push about it at all I think if you do it in a good way of course you need to like be persistent and all of that but like if you do it in a good way it's it's really powerful and and I mean crucial to any business without sales you can of course not exist in the long run so so uh I I I love working with sales that's still my favorite part of my role here now as well very interesting. And I think I'll pick on two words that you mentioned, because somewhere you mentioned that you have to be persistent if you're in sales. And that very closely equates with the startup culture as well. So if you're trying to build something, uh, if you are not persistent, it will not go anywhere. So mm. even if when you're looking for co-founders. And I think something which you mentioned uh, about sales, which is very interesting for our startup community here, is listening to the needs. I think yeah. the first picture, the visual picture that the mind draws of sales is that you're opening doors and like crashing the doors and going in, trying to get contracts. But I think the softer side of it, which you discuss, which is relationships, understanding the need. If you do that well, things will automatically start happening. Mm. So, so, so really interesting points there. Let's talk a little bit. Uh, because Google is on the forefront of technology, but even before that, let's go a little bit on what's your take on technology where are we headed like uh, uh, with technology what you see on the horizon when we talk about the word tech wow that, that, that's that's not a not a small question right uh, uh no i think um i think it's fascinating with tech and and uh, if you think about it and pause for a second like there are a few things that i think is like really exciting that has happened just during the last couple of years. The first thing is just looking at the world's population and, and that we are now have more than 50% of the world's population that is actually online. 
uh, which in itself is uh, really, really great. And, and uh, more and more people are coming online all the time. Uh, this, the second to that is also <laughs> the vast majority of data that is out there now and, and the computing power uh, that, that is also available in a way uh, that you couldn't imagine uh, some years ago. And also like the, the price for technology, how much that has also dropped so that it's not only, you know, a few companies now that can use technology and can use that as their advantage. Anyone almost as a business can get access to technology today. So it's more, it's from that perspective, it's more around like making sure that you as a company think through like, what is your purpose? What, what are you here to do, to change, to improve, whatever that is. And then of course, make use of technology. But the purpose there is absolutely essential because that's where you're going to stand out and be different from others. And even more so also with tech now, when so much, much things in tech can be automated and where AI can be applied. Uh, more and more companies will get there and will get how to make use of that. Uh, so then there are other things that will be important in, in terms of, of USA business to succeed. So it's like one aspect that I think is like really, really interesting. I also think, uh, you know, it's, it's very interesting to just pause and think of the role tech has played throughout COVID, uh, where, where I think it's safe to say that that uh, online has been a lifeline to most of us during during the pandemic and really will also be the the catalyst for economic comeback but with lifeline i mean in terms of getting access to news in connecting with others in continuing to work in in terms of like socializing in terms of you know continuing to learn things all of these things and, and we can see it in from different metrics i you know you hear a lot about like that uh, things that you thought would take 10 years have happened in a year uh, and and uh, uh, internet usage has increased with i think it's more than 60 percent during this time we see in searches for example in in um buying online or online shopping has increased with more than 200 percent and and um Another fun fact is that Google Meet, our uh, video solution, is developed primarily from Stockholm for the world. So I've, I've followed very, very closely our engineers and, and uh, like how extremely busy they've been mm -hmm. during the past mm -hmm. year and a half, where, you know, uh, the most busy days, we had three million new users per day, where they had to make sure, you know, that we kept capacity up as at the same time as developing new features. So all of that has been really interesting, I think. And also I um, I heard, I don't remember who it was, it was someone that also said that tech in COVID has also been like, a, there, there has become like a digital safety net mm -hmm. where you can also see for, for um, SMBs that the more advanced ones that are really, that have used, you know, digital tools throughout the pandemic have on average generated uh, 1.5x in revenue uh, versus the ones who hasn't and has employed uh, more than 3x the number of people than the ones that are not really like digital savvy so there are so many different dimensions you can you can talk about when it comes uh, to tech and the role tech plays for for everyone thank you so much i completely agree the question was very broad and, but you have created a, you have weaved a very interesting constellation there. So it's like a star <laughs> group. So I'm trying to, let, let me pick some threads over there. So we, we started about the explosive growth or how tech has transformed in terms of, I remember my first computer was a 16K. It was a handheld. <laughs> I bought it from US in 1980, uh, 88. The 16K computer, I was saying, 
which can do so much more than calculation. <laughs> so, okay, so so that that era. So if, if so, within a lifetime, we have seen a huge transformation, and it's a transformation where you started about discussing about access, and then you talked about the COVID lifeline. So completely agreed that access has uh, completely skyrocketed in terms of tech, and there's been. Phenomenal growth. So even if we go to enterprise culture or the large organizations, initially the role of tech or the tech head was very vertical focused mm. and would come in and you will form a department and then say, no, 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 this is not going to happen because they'll create silos. So it has to cut across it horizontally. But now I think it's very much, how would, say, how would you say, a, a pervasive soup. So the company, the, the entire company needs to live in tech. So it's not separated from core processes. So great advice over there. Um, I'm just trying to see what to pick up first, because you talked about two or three very interesting points. I would like to pick up tech with purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, and you also talked about the Google Meet being uh, um, made here and the change in consumer behaviors. Mm -hmm. So where would you like to start? Should we type, uh, start with tech with purpose or change in consumer behavior that you've seen in the last two or three years? Your choice, pick one. Okay, okay. <laughs> Well, well, let's start with the consumer behavior then, because okay, um, I think uh, you know we 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 can see that very clearly through all the searches that are being done, and and uh, you know, uh, and it's been it's been fascinating to see how how the searches also has changed mm -hmm. throughout the the pandemic time, and and. Um, you know, with the many of the tools that that we have made available online for anyone, like for example, mm. Google, like search trends, uh, that I know that a lot of the, our customers have used to also try to keep up with like what are consumers looking for right now, uh, and then pivot a little bit like how how you try to, yeah. you know, reach your customers in that. But I think also overall, I think that uh, you know when tech is evolving and all of us have i mean everyone have our smartphones uh i don't know like on average i think it's said that we have 20 no soon we'll have like 26 devices per person i don't know what the average is now wow. but if you think about also about all the connected devices you have at home um you know we we have a lot of connected tech and all mm. of this also makes us as consumers a lot more demanding. Um, we we expect more value. We mm. uh, ex expect things to go faster. I joked a few years ago about mobile speed, mm -hmm. and mm. and uh, where where uh, that there was some service being made saying that if a web page is loading slower than three seconds. The way we as humans react is as strong as when we are watching a horror movie. Uh, you know, three seconds that we, we're gone. Like so, so companies like there, there is so much more demand, and 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 you need to be really agile and and really understand and work fast in order to keep up with the the consumer demand. Um, so I think that. Uh, that is changing very rapidly mm. and that then actually also goes over to the whole idea around you know having having a very strong and and good purpose um because if you're true to like your purpose and, and you know why your company exists uh and then you have a clear view of you know what you mm. want to communicate and and like how you're working to get your customers in and then you know show them value you are in a good uh, uh, position um but what is happening right now is uh also the the increased like focus on on uh, privacy which is very important to most yeah. consumers uh for for a company to succeed nowadays, it's extremely important to have a very clear view of uh, like your your first party data and what strategy you have with that, and making sure that you know you ask for consent from your users 
so that you can can use that data to be relevant. Uh, but you can see then that uh, consumers, you know, in order to give you that consent as a company, they want mm. something back. They're not just going to give you that. So so then it's it's back to like uh, the purpose and like finding ways to really bring value to show like, well, if you, uh, dear customer, consent for me to use your data, this is what you will get in return. So that's this whole idea also about the demand and what, what consumers are looking for. Um, and that is changing very rapidly, um, uh, which we, we see almost every day here. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. So I'll again try to draw some startup points for our startup community. I think the point you made about the mobile speed and the three second and the horror movie, great learning for all those who are making apps and web pages three second or even shorter. So make yeah, it sure, yeah. uh, make sure that you are in a constant engagement and don't bring a blank screen or, or a blank experience that would not work. So that's a message to startups because uh, consumer attention span, uh, I think we have moved from a stage of, uh, uh, how would you say written newspapers, 244 character based information bits. So I think that's, and that means that our consumption power is like hundred times more now. So we can, mm. uh, so, so that's one thing. Second point that you made about 26 devices per person and uh, 5G coming in. I think that's also something very interesting for all of those who are going to be working in IOT and other uh, spaces which are relevant for this. And then you brought a point of purpose, which is very interesting because 26 devices are connected, but are 26 people connected. So is the is there a is there a root purpose or a so we talk about root cause but what's the root purpose of the technology? So I think excellent point over there. Mm -hmm. And the last point I think uh, for uh, for startups working because because I've seen startups working and the privacy policy is okay. Let's copy paste it from somewhere here. We are a startup and let's move on with that. So I think privacy is very crucial on consumer agenda. And as Anna is saying, it's it's a value exchange. Like what value do you uh, bring to them as opposed to what value are you taking from them? So it's an ex exchange process. We will go uh, more and more into this. So uh, Anna, let's uh, move a little bit on uh, in terms of automation. Let's see. Let me try to weave a couple of themes. So automation is one thing that you picked that word up. Uh, but we have also talked about how technology has transformed in the last two years with COVID and how. So let's take two threads. One thread is what kind of work future do you see happening? So that's the part of work. And the behavioral shift or the, uh, that we have seen in terms of the consumer space, is it here to stay? So again, your pick, do you want to discuss the consumer space first or should we take the workspace? Over to you. <laughs> um, no, it doesn't, uh, we can start with consumers again. Um, okay. I think that uh, I mean, it's such an interesting time because mm. to one extent, tech has made the world global, right? Yeah. And, and um, you know, companies can really have like a global audience, mm -hmm. uh, which is a big opportunity that you don't need to think about, you know, customers just in Sweden, for example, if you're based here. But the competition is as fierce. So competition can also come from anywhere uh, in this global world. Um, that's why it's so important back to purpose and back to like having a super clear, like very customer centric strategy in terms of like how you're going to acquire customers, how you're going to make sure that they they appreciate what you do so that they stick around and so forth, so working with the retention. But the other interesting thing that has also happened due to COVID is that the world ha has also gone a lot more local than before. Mm -hmm. um, that is also something we see in, in the number of searches. I mean, the, the, the searches connected to like local offerings have exploded even more. It's like 2000 plus percent year over year growth uh, in that. So, so there, I also think it's been really interesting to see smaller but local businesses and, and the ones that have 
adapted fast to change because that's mm. also important here right in in terms of like really making sure that that you try to be agile you try to you know test and learn and 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 uh, move on basically mm. and in that space we have also uh, during the last year i think it's over 200 new features we have developed also try to support businesses in this everything for like curbside pickups to okay. online orders and all of these things uh, to do our part in that um so so uh um yeah th that's my my view on the consumer side should i pause there do you, are there any no no that, wanna... that's really great that's really great so 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 you you took covid as an example and i think technology has become as you said lifeline or or technology came on a rescue mission and did it so mm -hmm. and that's where you we had these localization services so localization like kind of jumped up and it helped out humanity uh, with what, uh, as you are mentioning. And uh, very relevantly, you're talking about the global audience when you're talking about the startups. So if startups are creating, uh, we had a startup here like a few months ago, Johan Atli, he, he created a vertical social network called Fish Brain. Okay, mm -hmm. so, uh, so fishing. Now, and he was, uh, he was mentioning that for us, we said that we'll just go and launch in US. Uh, another startup here, uh, uh, like a year ago, Caroline uh, Valirud was here discussing volumental mm -hmm. uh, primary market US. So, so very important point that you're trying to uh, uh, that you're making here that uh, don't get stuck in the market box. Just because you are in a particular market doesn't mean your business needs to be in that market. Exactly, so, exactly that, and and. Uh... Uh, not to just sit there and promote all of Google's products, but mm. but another great tool, uh, if you haven't seen it, is a, a tool called Market Finder that a mm -hmm. lot of our customers use. Where you can also go in and you know type in what what you know industry you're in, which products or services you're offering, and so forth. And there you can see the demand based on searches in different countries, but you can also mm -hmm. see competition and other in, interesting metrics. So, so I know that many companies use that as like one of the sources for when to, you know, define their export strategy or go to market mm -hmm. strategy for which, which uh, markets to focus on, et cetera. So that's actually quite power powerful. Okay. Um, yeah. Let's then switch to the other uh, side of discussion, which was implication of COVID or the great shift that we have seen and what does it mean for future of work for example so consumer side we have talked about and at times it becomes if you get st stuck to a hab so habits it's usually difficult to leave a habit so if you have adopted the habit of ordering x or y online maybe that's there to stay and maybe that kind of transforms into a different way uh, but work itself like office environments spaces any take that you uh, 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 how would you see yeah i think evolving? this is the this is such an interesting topic and i i mean we we are really all of us are part of this historic shift right uh, and and no one has the answer to what it would look like or or how to do things to be super successful and you see different companies having different approaches to this um google's approach overall is that uh we are going to move into uh, what we call a hybrid model right now it's still voluntary to to come to work um, and it's a bit different in different countries all depending on where we are in in the actual pandemic yeah but eventually like when knock on wood things will have become even better and maybe we are in a post-covid phase uh, we, we are on average going to have a, a model that is three days in the office and two mm -hmm. days at home. Uh, and, and that is going to be very interesting, I think. Uh, but but mm -hmm. a, main, a main focus in that, I think, will be around like, how do you then create an inclusive environment? Yeah. You know, making sure that uh, independent on if you're in the office or if you're mm -hmm. home that that works out well 
and and that's not going to be an easy fix but there again technology is going to play a crucial role in continuing to improve like meeting tools and formats and and finding ways for that to work um Mm -hmm. I personally, and this is this is my personal opinion. It's not a Google opinion, but that is, mm -hmm. to me, it's absolutely critical for people to meet in person. Mm -hmm. uh, I see that already here when we have started to to open up the Stockholm office. When people come in, like the energy they get from meeting each other, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. for myself as well, in in uh, bumping into a lot of people that I don't have meetings with on a regular basis, and just chatting for a few minutes getting some new like many times interesting insights that i wouldn't mm -hmm. you know, know of otherwise so i think like for for culture building uh, as well as for idea creation uh, mm. it, it is very important to meet and also i think my last point is also from a leadership perspective it's really really hard to lead only in a virtual format i think um it's mm. very easy to be become a sender uh it's much more uh, difficult to really get this like uh, dialogue going and and i think that you lose so many dimensions of your leadership for example if i'm mm. gonna host a meeting if i do that physically you know when you enter that room you can kind of sense the energy levels in yeah. the room and and when you have a message you need to land you can you know people don't have to speak you can by just looking at their reactions their body language or you know eye contact many many things that you usually don't even think about but those are signals that you kind of lose when you're just on a screen that i think is really important mm when in the day-to-day -day work as well as when you work more like long-term with strategy and so forth excellent points and i'm trying to create bubbles here so so i think <laughs> the one thing where this is leading is that of course there are certain professions which require high interaction or presence so for example the hospitality sector so which went through the biggest which was probably the hardest hit creative sector hospitality sector because they are present space concerts and all uh, uh, an interaction at the at the food table for example crucial for an experience and then you bring out a very interesting point on the the energy the creativity the inter the interaction and creative side so that can happen in traditional office environments as well so like developers meeting designers meeting business teams and kind of co-creating ideas with all the digital tools that still uh, goes there uh, in and then you uh, mentioned a point on the leadership uh, mm -hmm. in terms of communication I, I think i completely uh, agree with you that at times it's very difficult to communicate because uh, you feel limited on a two-dimensional space mm -hmm. like how would the personal interaction so, so great points over there uh, let's move uh, forward a little bit i had i've been always been so fascinated with uh, with the simplicity of google design so as opposed to i would initially probably i went through that transition of netscape alta vista and whatever search engine and then came google which was which was a blank screen and then you said okay now what do i do yeah. <laughs> there are not 20 hotspots here to choose from yeah. so so maybe if you could talk a little bit like what's the is what's the philosophy behind product creation consumer interaction and all uh, yeah at google i think overall like uh, the the like innovation like strategy i think mm. uh, even though i'm not like part of that but you know what i've learned over the years is first of all it's about like solving big problems having mm -hmm. like a very big vision uh for for what you want to to solve and and connected to that i mean google's mission statement is still the same as when when larry and uh, sergey um, founded google and that is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful that's the same but that has been the same you know uh when we launched chrome um so, so the first one is like solving 
or having big ideas. And the second is like solving big complex problems. And then the third uh, component is mm -hmm. uh, to, to make it useful for everyone. So that goes okay. for Google search engine, but that also goes, for example, for, for Chrome. Uh, another example, when it was like uh, some engineers that didn't think that the, the, um, uh, the other uh, browsers maybe met, met the requirements that they hoped for and they, uh, you know, started to, to develop Chrome. Or mm. that's how Gmail started as well. Uh, that's how Translate started, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So th that has always been kind of the philosophy behind. Mm. Uh, and then now nowadays, uh, the, the red thread through all our products, I would say, is that we want them to be helpful. So mm -hmm. helpfulness is a key word to us. And that again okay. is, uh, you know, uh, helpful for, with the search engine to get you the best results possible or maps getting you from A to B uh, in the best way possible mm -hmm. um, and so forth. So helpfulness and added to that, there is a big focus also on sustainability. So for example, okay. maps, uh, just as a, one example, not only do we want to help you get from A to B as fast as possible, given like real time traffic conditions. Now you can also select uh, if you want to get the directions based on, uh, uh, you know, a sustainability lens. Mm -hmm. uh, so which which way is best from an environment perspective? Um, so, so those are like two aspects of uh, of the thinking behind when Google innovate. Excellent, excellent. I'll try to summarize that for startups. Like, uh, very interesting because in your initial conversation, you talked about uh, making things for everyone, and I think everyone is a great word because when you put everyone in center, then you are trying to really, really make technology accessible across all so you you don't you're not trying to create barriers that only this kind of people will be able and that i see in the search uh, engine for example mm. so that reduces access barriers uh, and probably when when that's happening then the design team automatically is in a process of elimination rather than process of overfeeding the design because mm. cuz that you see a lot in startup space that you try to create a, a big 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 elephant level product while you need something which is more like an ant level and can navigate quickly in the market. Exactly. Uh, and then uh, very interestingly, when you talked about helpfulness, the message here again for the startups is, what does your tech do for people and what problem does it solve and does it solve it in a better and a more helpful way and the sustainability link. So it's a great lesson here in, time, in terms of minimizing, uh, keeping the features as simple as simplicity helpfulness and sustainability. Hmm. Um, let's talk about a little bit while we are on the startup space, because uh, I've seen news coming out from Google being involved in the startup space with, uh, with female entrepreneurs. If you would like to go into that a little bit and tell our audience how that program has been initiative. Uh, well, I mean, there are several programs that, that our unit that is called Google for Startups hmm uh do um and and overall like many of the programs that that we have in this space are mentor driven mm -hmm. uh, okay. meaning meaning that it's a lot about like opening doors to both google experts to partners and to customers and working one-on-one -on -one with small groups to really you know mentoring and being of help where we can um but then there are some some uh, just different examples of programs we have one is uh, for founders that is called Founders Academy, that is not mm. only on, on the, like the business side, it's also about like how you, you know, how you develop as a strong leader and how mm. you build like a strong uh, culture. Another, another program is called Startup School. That mm. is more like an open to everyone program. Uh, uh, I don't think we have any, anything open now, but I know that uh, there are, many of those programs that will open up next year again. Mm. Um, and, and that is uh, various trainings uh, where startups can be introduced to different Google tools in ads, in cloud, uh, analytics, etc. Um, and then 
we have something called Code Labs. That's mm -hmm. for more technical folks and different programs in that. And the last part is something that is called Google for Startup Accelerator. Okay. Um, and that is um, across several like cohorts uh, throughout like a certain number of months um, okay. uh, where uh, where we help help startups both on like technical and business challenges and that's a program that you that you get to apply for um, mm. and that is hosted in different regions uh, of the world throughout the year so those okay. are different uh, initiatives that we have we know how important the startup ecosystem is uh, mm -hmm. around the world. We we uh, we see that over and over again, and and uh, we really believe that startups many times are, you know, the engines of economic growth. Mm -hmm. uh, we have also seen in the pandemic that many times startups are more resilient; they're faster and can okay. and can adapt to change quicker than uh, maybe bigger companies can do, and and. Uh, it's also interesting to see, you know, the, the way we see it, startups many times are the ones that create new jobs, of course, and can also mm -hmm. be in the forefront of digital transformation because many startups are bo born in a digital way. Uh, so so it's, uh, uh, it's different than it used to be, which is also very good. Excellent. Uh, so I think you guys are doing great work in uh, in the startup space, and uh, entrepreneurs here can go get directly with your startup uh, division to uh, learn more about it. But given uh, you you talked about the job uh, jobs, that word kind of stuck over here, like startups are job creators. What's your view on the current talent situation? You think mm -hmm. we have enough talent in tech, or can there be something more that can be done? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a that, that's a good question, and I think, well, talking from a Swedish perspective, then now, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. uh, given like the, the many tech companies we have here, both unicorns and and newly started, mm -hmm. I mean, the the competition for for tech talent is immense. So so uh, I would say that no, we don't have enough tech talent at all, uh, uh, and I think that I mean this this is. Uh, like the one of the most important topics, I think, because uh, and the, because the thing is, we know that technology and automation and AI have the opportunity to to really you know change societies in, mm. in a really good way. We know that the GDP will be able to increase. We know that net net uh, it will be able to create even more jobs. Mm the 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 main challenge is to also help uh you know people shift skills uh, mm -hmm. from having other professions that haven't required okay. digital skills where we know that 90 plus percent of all works in a few years will require digital skills mm -hmm. so it's it's not only about like you know focusing on on young people and and have more you know, pick the right educations out of school. It's also about like getting into uh, a habit for all of us more in terms of like lifelong learning, learning every day, understanding that any time in your life, you can actually get a new career um, and, and you can take a lot of different ways to learn new things. It's not that you need to go back to school for four years. It can be to take online classes. It can be to listen to podcasts. It can be to talking to people, you know, that know things that you don't, etc. But that's something that is, it's it's not for st startups to solve. It's for society to solve. But it's society. It's for businesses to help employees continue to develop. But it's also for all of us individuals to make sure that we keep up with change. Um, okay. So, so that, that that's my broader view uh, on the talent situation. Excellent. We I know we have a hard cut in two minutes, so yeah. I'll just put a couple of more short questions from audience. So I, we have already picked a couple of there, like entrepreneurs. Your one advice on one soft human skill that entrepreneurs need to have to succeed. Well, very difficult. Oh, question. what a good I'm question! I'm already feeling. It. Yeah, what a good question. <laughs> Uh, human skill i mean the word human there i think is the key thing mm -hmm. you know because it many times it comes down to people so to make sure that 
uh, you as a, a leader is good in, in in trying to put together a good team with different you know qualities personalities backgrounds experiences uh, and okay. that's what's gonna make a big difference i i think um okay. so, so being that people manager putting people first and understanding that okay people first last question uh your thoughts on impact business and futures of companies or startups going to impact sector does that look promising do we have enough infrastructure support there or last point of thought and then we close this yeah well well in terms of, of impact i mean impact is in so many different areas uh mm. but but i think that is very interesting and and uh, absolutely areas uh that there is immense opportunities i would say uh so so uh uh yeah i don't i don't know like okay. to go into any detail but but on okay. average absolutely there's a lot of opportunity perfect perfect and i thank you so much uh, for your time and for being here we are very happy that we could go into such a deep discussion in a period of 50 minutes so Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, community, for raising interesting questions and Startup Grind uh, uh, team. Don't miss out first December event with Mindler. Ricard will be here. Anna, once again, a big thank you. Very, thank you very thank much. You. Really great to be here. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.